Welcome to the Expanding Worlds podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Caldo. This week I continue with the interviews I recorded on my recent trip home and I'm talking to Mitch Halligan from an organisation called Red Inc. Red Inc is based in Lismore in New South Wales and among other things provides support for young people to transition to work that they find both rewarding and are properly rewarded for. Mitch talks about how they help people do this and the kind of support they offer but I think more importantly he talks about making sure that at the forefront is the idea that everything should be outcome based. And that's not that these outcomes will necessarily be quick or easy to achieve. Red Inc seems to be very good at finding alternative paths to success and the key there is progress. That seems to be a theme across many of the interviews I've done so far on this podcast. It's all about progress and whether you need to be patient for progress or look long term, the aim should always be about moving forward in some way. I also talked to Mitch about something that's been in the news, at least in the UK recently, around the idea that one reason that people with additional needs don't find paid employment is because employers can't justify paying them the same wage as someone else who may perform the same tasks a bit quicker. And it's been suggested that if people with additional needs could be paid less per hour, then more employers might actually give them jobs. This is obviously a controversial topic because everyone deserves to be treated equally but it's also true that the number of people with additional needs in paid employment is actually appallingly low. And I have to say personally, I'm not that keen on the idea of different wage rates. But it was interesting to hear Mitch's views on this, particularly as he's actually working in the area. And he actually offers a practical solution for some jobs, at least for those jobs where you can measure outputs. Having not yet faced this situation myself, I'm open to debate on this topic. The way that Red Ink works is certainly very effective and the successes that Mitch shares are very inspiring. Having visited the organisation, what Mitch says about it being part of the community is clearly a key part of the reason why it's very successful. Coming to the stage where I need to think about my daughter's future after school, I haven't found that many organisations doing what Red Ink does. Although in the UK there is shared lives, which if you'd like more information about them, you can find it in podcast episode one called The Art Project. And Shared Lives offers at least one way to progress people's skills. If you're aware of other organisations that are similar to Red Inc., then I'd love to hear from you. Please drop me an email at deborah at journeyskills.com. That's D-E-B-R-A at journeyskills.com. Not only might you help me, but I can share those resources with others because, frankly, it shouldn't be this difficult to find a solution and help our young people find a purpose in their daily lives. Apologies, too, for some of the sound quality in here. I recorded this in a fairly open plan area, so you might hear some background noises. Anyway, let's hear from Mitch. This week we're talking to Mitch Halligan from an organisation called Red Inc, which is based in Lismore in New South Wales in Australia. Welcome Mitch. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit about the organisation, where it started? Sure. Well, Red Inc began about 30 years ago. Five families got together. Their kids were coming out of high school and they realised that there was nothing there for them. Its name actually stands for Realising Every Dream Incorporated and it's something we strive still to do today. We employ about 95 five staff and support about 240 families with disabilities across this region so my job here is work and training coordinator so anyone with a dream or a, or a goal of getting work and education will come through me to help support that that can mean anything from setting up study support to ensuring that they have accessible classrooms and access to toilets and facilities and so I, I, I support them in this region to do driving too you can't get a job in this area unless you've got a car and a license that includes adapted vehicles There are some people, obviously, who will never get a license that have disabilities. Then we do an awful lot of travel training. What age do they come to you if they're looking for work? They begin at post-school. So they come to us at the end of high school and we support them right through till retirement. Red Inc. are predominantly known in the the sector for our creative arts. We don't do the sheltered workshop stuff at Red Inc. Everything that they do is outcome-based. So our visual artists work with visual artists and learn real art practice they have resumes that reflect that showing all their exhibitions all their big sales and things we have several that are even running their own businesses selling out of retail shops Um, music wise we we also do a lot of work with the musicians and they are supported by musicians we have two bands at present well one band and a solo artist We've got a band called Brotherhood of the Blues who are on saved enough money through gigging to record their second album. They played the Blues Festival last year. So you mentioned that the, the students that do the art, the visual arts, they, and the guys in the band, they get paid for this. 
Do they get all the money or is it part, is it shared or? If we put the exhibitions on, we do pretty much as a gallery would. We also make printed t-shirts and other things where we've paid for all that. So they get, they get 15 or 20% of the sales on that kind of item. But the musicians are paid by the people that want them to gig and they keep everything, particularly the Brotherhood of the Blues. They, they may have begun through Red Ink, but they are their own independent thing now. And you should definitely look them up, guys. They've got some great stuff. The focus here sounds like it's work. Are there other independent skills that you work on with? Oh, independent living is a big part of what we do too. Most of our people have that goal, at least long term, as a goal. That's money skills, that's budgeting, that's cooking, shopping, meal planning, all of those things that form part of what we do. We have a lot of gamers now. We're, we're growing a very quickly growing group of ASD people, particularly young men. We have a social gaming group, which has been working really well prior to losing all our venues in a flood recently. Yes, look that one up. They get together once a week and they game actually physically together instead of just in their bedrooms at night. And they sit and they come up with little projects. They run a YouTube channel and do game reviews at the moment. A few of them have created blogs and the social gaming doesn't have a direct outcome. The outcomes come once that that confidence and friendship grows with the group. And that's, I think, the best way we've found so far working with them. Professionals that come in, are they do they just volunteer their time? We have facilitators that's, that are gamers and coders, and we do get volunteers that just come in to give their time. But the coders and that, they, they come in? They're paid facilitators. As I said with the music and the art, is that we, we work very hard at Red Ink to make sure that our staff actually are skilled in what they do, so that a real outcome can come from it. Do you think that works better, having paid professionals than just having volunteers who might absolutely, have a skill? Absolutely, because we can make sure that they do what they're supposed to do and, and there's accountability there. The guys that are teaching, when they teach, do they have a structured class or do they, I guess, make it bespoke depending on who they're teaching? If they're doing it one-on-one, -on -one, it's it's very much individually tailored, but if they're working in groups, it, they're, they're six or 12-week programs. And yes, they are programs. They have very clear objectives and goals with each week to get to that end result towards that. What we try to do is bring out their skills and their abilities, get them to be a, a real integral part of community. The social skills sound like they're also really important. What else do you do to facilitate the building social skills? Do they do things outside? Ready oh, most of this is outside, yeah. There's there busking groups that will go out. They busk together. Uh, we do a lot of health and well-being too. We have three personal trainers on the staff and use the university gym. Work uh, with pony pals. We've got several guys who really have grown in themselves and gained confidence through learning how to, you know, groom and look after horses and walk them. They don't ride them. They they look after them. We have another group that do ride. So. We we, we access a lot of the community, absolutely. That's why that's why we are in community. You know? yeah, that's also of, essential. I think that's essential. It is certainly for our philosophy on it. A lot of the other services are out of town and you've got to, and they've gotta lay on buses and things to get people there and we do drama, dance. We got a professional dancer who's one of our um, personal trainers, and we ensure that there's uh, at least showcases every year. Many of your students work in, in local businesses. Absolutely, we we just put a young woman who's now receptionist for an organisation called Social Futures, and she's working five days a fortnight, which is all she was after. But as a full time on open employment rates, we don't do the sheltered workshop stuff. You know, it's called in this country they call it uh, Australian Disability enterprises and uh, I work really hard not to put any of the guys into those unless that's really where they are at and what they want you can in Australia you can employ in the open employment sector and still use a supported wage system that's my worst case scenario for me so you rather that they have well, what a better word a real job and they're getting the same pay as their peers Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Australia have an award system for all jobs and um, so there is a clear and absolute pay rate for everything. This is an interesting point to talk about then because what do you think about the idea that people who have disabilities would get paid less because they may work slower? 
depending on the job, I think that's that's reasonable. You know, if your job is to processing plant or packaging things, yeah. if you can't keep pace, I suppose you probably shouldn't get paid as much. But if that's what you really want to do, I'll support that and I'll get you in there. But we would work out what percentage you do work at. And, we, and the objective is every 12 months is that we have that reassessed. And if you're getting faster, you get paid more. Yeah. Get moved up to an equivalent pay rate if you can match the quantity and quality. So I don't have an issue with that. I just have an issue with the supported the sheltered workshop model because the wages are that they start at ridiculously low rates and they don't seem to progress that's the issue then that they that's, don't progress and yeah well the system isn't designed for them to progress back to what is even a minimum wage in this country so there's no real encouragement for those people to actually try any harder either why would you work harder if you're not going to get paid more than a couple of dollars an hour so i find that yeah i i try not to go there obviously there are people that that is perfect for and that's all they want and they're happy with that and that's great I said, basically we don't I don't do anything with anyone that's not their decision you know nothing about you without you so it's very user driven so it's up to the guys Entirely. who come in about what they want to do and everything I do in my role is based on their goals and their interests it may mean that they've got a very high flying goal and we've got to take a few roundabout ways to get there but we work we work towards that goal always an example would be I got a young man who wanted to be a nurse so we put him into that preparation for success course at the university and because of his high schooling and support units he didn't complete standard English or advanced English and he couldn't manage to write at university level despite uh, three hours a week support we put in here uh, but we decided at the end of that that we were going to tackle it a different way so we put him into a work experience at one of the local hospitals on a, on, as wardsman to make sure he really wanted to do it because that, that's important to make sure and he loved it and so we're putting him in through a community college and he's going to do it through certificate level courses and work his way up in the meantime we keep the study going and he can still build those skills to be able to write essays do you see a time when you'll reach capacity we know that what we are is is good Everyone that works here loves it. Everyone that is supported here loves it. So we know that we can't keep growing. We can't do that and keep what we do. We are a bit of a niche provider. So we have a, a staff cap we've decided at 150. And once we've reached that, it, that will be dictated by how many people we, we can support well, not taking on so many people that we can't support them well. So would that suggest then that you need a number of organizations of smaller sizes? To be offering the same absolutely there should be a lot of organizations like us out there but sadly there aren't and the big ones that go statewide or or national they just don't have that connection with with the with their people with that you mean the community the local community or the people they support they don't then there's no connection there so that makes it much harder job we certainly couldn't do what we do without that connection with our people yeah, because it's all about them. Do you think that gets lost when you become a big organisation or is it because of the way it's funded? Or? I know that we would, it would get lost here if we got too big. It is, it's about funding, it's about, I, I think it's just about a big organisation too. I just think that in when you work with people, you can't go corporate. I don't think you can and make it work. But from the government's point of view or from the funders' point of view, what they want is to have as many people in one well, place as possible. Well, it's supposed to be about choice and control, our national disability insurance scheme here. Choice and control, that's the key words they say. Have you identified other organisations like... Reading. There are some. They're few and far between, but there are some. Why do you think that is though? Because clearly being able to transition people into work is the objective. It's my part of this organization's objective, absolutely. And it's and if it's the objective of the person, that's the goal. Why do you think then you don't find other as many other organizations, small ones like this? Because clearly it works for, it works for you guys. Yeah. Do you think there's a reason I, for that? Some of it is state based systems, I think too. Everything they do is done differently. New South Wales, you can't even get a train into Queensland because as soon as you hit the border, the train tracks are a different size. So it doesn't, you know, it's been like that forever. And I think a lot of it's that. I think it's because we came from families. I think it's, it's how we were created. I think it was because the families created it. Okay, Mitch, thank you very much for your insights into this. Thanks, I, I hope it 
Yeah, and check out Red Ink. We're worth having a look at. I think it's a model that a lot more places should use. Key takeaways this week, outcomes and progress. Two words that mix used in our conversation and seem to sum up to me what Red Ink does so well. After listening, you'll no doubt realise he's not a great fan of what he calls the sheltered workshop model. Although, as he does say, this may be what some people actually want. And so I guess the third important word in here is choice. When Mitch is talking about progress, he is also talking about finding a path that works. As with the young man he talked about who wanted to be a nurse, the path may not always be the first one taken, but if you look hard enough, you will inevitably find another way. One of the underlying parts of what we talk about the journey skills is purpose. Having a purpose is so important to everyone but it seems that often young people with additional needs finish school which does provide them with a purpose and there is often nothing out there to replace this. Too often they end up sitting at home or if they do go out it's really just sitting in a different place. I don't think that this necessarily provides that sense of purpose so we not only have to think about where they go each day but what they do and what benefit it is to them. There is no doubt that the Red Ink model works and I'm hoping that I can find an organisation with the same ethos to help my daughter when she finishes full-time education. As always if you could leave a podcast review that would be great and if you have any recommendations for guests or for topics you want me to talk more about, then you can message me on Instagram or Facebook at Deborah Caldo, or you can email podcast at expandingworlds.com.